Morning, everyone. Everybody, thank you for coming. Appreciate it very much. Uh, my name is Juan Zarati. I'm a senior advisor here at CSIS. Uh, I think uh, many of us know each other. Uh, for those of you who haven't figured it out, I run the friends and family program here at <laughs> CSIS. I only host events with close friends and family, so Farah uh, fits neatly into that category. So I'm very happy to to have Farah here and to see so many uh, friends around the table. This is actually a great time to have this discussion with Farah. Uh, in part because Farah, uh, I think, has played an incredibly innovative role uh, in her role as a special representative to Muslim communities, uh, in part not only based on who she is and her experience in this field, but also the innovation of uh, diplomatic interchange with uh, communities and non-state actors as a means of uh, engaging in, in diplomacy, which is uh, a real credit to Secretary Clinton, who uh, named uh, Farah uh, at the start of the Obama administration. Um, and as well, we, we have two, I think, important events uh, in the context of uh, Muslim engagement. Uh, yesterday, the Obama administration put out their, uh, their domestic strategy uh, entitled Empowering Local Partners to Prevent uh, Violent Extremism in the United States, which in some ways, I think, takes the model that FAR has built internationally and adopts it domestically. So I think that's very important. And then ne next week, uh, Secretary Clinton is announcing, uh, thanks to FAR's good work, uh, and leadership, the Women in Public Service Initiative on December 15th, which is a major initiative uh, working with the women's colleges in the United States and women leaders around the world to ensure that uh, women have opportunities and are empowered to lead in public service. So this is a wonderful opportunity, I think, to speak with Farah. For those of you who don't know her, let me uh, give you a, a slight introduction. Uh, again, uh, she and I have been uh, close friends and colleagues for a number of years. Uh, but she was named to this role, a unique role, the first in uh, U.S. history uh, in June 2009. Uh, it largely built off of the role she was playing uh, for Dan Freed as Assistant Secretary for European Affairs uh, in the European Bureau, doing outreach to Muslim communities in Europe uh, for three years, Farah? Almost. Three years, almost. <laughs> uh, and then before that, Farah was um, one of the most important directors in the National Security Council, uh, working for the Deputy National Security Advisor for Global Democracy and Promotion. And there she took on the leadership role within the White House uh, with respect to Muslim engagement uh, and creative uh, opportunities. Uh, I credit Farah uh, with some of the most important uh, symbolic and real actions that the Bush administration took. Uh, for example, the placement of the first Quran in the White House. Uh, we worked together on the naming of the first envoy to the OIC uh, and a host of other uh, very important efforts that. Uh, were, were crystallized in the uh, Bush administration and have continued in the Obama administration. What we'd like to do here is uh, we're, we're, we've made this uh, purposely an intimate uh, gathering. We want to make this a real discussion. So Far and I are going to talk maybe for about 25 minutes, uh, do a Q&A uh, session, and then open it up to you all uh, because Far plays a, an incredibly important role on the leading edge of our diplomacy, uh, and I think you all want to hear from her. So that, let's start. Farah, um, one of the things that I find interesting, I think you have, uh, we've talked about, uh, it's important, is the title that you hold. Um, you're not a special representative to the Muslim world. You're a, a special representative to Muslim communities. Can you explain why that's, that's important and how that has shaped uh, what you, you do? Well, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming this morning. It's a pleasure to see you all, some old friends and some new ones. Uh, I also want to thank you all personally for um, inviting me to CSIS. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I will say that this is one of the most important lessons that we have learned over the course of the last 10 years, and that is lexicon matters. How you say something is a direct reflection, obviously, to how people hear it, but importantly, on issues that are as sensitive as engaging with Muslim communities around the world, we cannot be sloppy about how we talk about these issues. Um, you and I know that in the work that we did um, in the last administration, we spent a lot of time thinking about the right phrase, how we talk about things. Life has moved on. There are lots of changes that have happened over the course of the last 10 years. And as we think about the role that the Secretary established for me at the State Department, we were very precise to talk about um, what the President said in Cairo, which is mutual interest and mutual respect. And I want to talk about the mutual respect. You cannot respect Muslims around the world if you paint them all with the same brush. And you assume that a Muslim living in Lebanon has the same makeup 
and lives their life the same way as a Muslim living in Sao Paulo. From the United States point of view, we have to give respect around the world, Muslims in Muslim majority countries and Muslims that live as minorities. So in the title, uh, the special representative to Muslim communities, we're hoping to touch upon the nuance, talk about the dignity of the, the diversity of Muslims around the world, and to focus very specifically on one of the cornerstones of how we're doing engagement, which is community on the ground. So that's why my title is what it is. Far, could you speak a little bit to sort of the, the changing nature of diplomacy and, and what you've done to concentrate on uh, what I would turn to be more grassroots diplomacy, uh, people to people diplomacy. And so you're, you deal obviously with foreign officials, but you also deal perhaps even more so with representatives of civil society religious groups, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about the model? Sure, I, I think it's really important what you're saying. I mean, I, we all understand that the State Department does a lot of things in a, in a wide variety of ways, and we do government to government um, interchange in, in, in many ways. But um, one of the things that I think uh, that we, we have um, learned a lot about is obviously the role of civil society, but the ability to actually listen to what's taking place even within a country. Um, and these are lessons that I learned on the ground when I was doing my work with Dan Freed in the Europe Bureau that even if you look at a country like Spain, um, for me to assume that the conversation that I'm having with Muslims in Madrid will be the exact the same as what's taking place in Barcelona would be faulty. You can't say Spain is like this, nor could I say Egypt is like that. So um, to take the time to listen to different community groups, to understand who is making up these communities, and very importantly, not to assume that someone, just because they're the head of XYZ organization, represents everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so we, when you unpack that, it means that uh, community to community, we are really looking at how civil society is made up, the gender balance. But what I'm doing very particularly in this job um, is not just people to people, which is critical, and that's part of my mandate, but we're very specifically focusing on the communities under the age of 30. Because when you look at the demographics of Muslims worldwide, most Muslims are in the world uh, are under under 30, and in many countries that number is over the over 62. Some some places it's 75 percent, some places it's 80 percent. Um, and you think about the fact that one fourth of our planet is Muslim. Mm -hmm. And most of these folks are under the age of 30. Many of them are digital natives. Um, how do you think about how we interface between the United States government, what's taking place with the people? So we want to do more to build up uh, our relationships, our ability to communicate, and uh, most importantly, our ability to listen to what the issues are on the ground. With respect to that, can you talk to us a little bit about what you have seen and, and perceived with respect to identity? Your, your point about uh, the, the vast majority being under 30 uh, and how the internet uh, may impact their sense of identity, global yes. affairs, foreign policy might impact. What is the role of identity? Uh, because I think it's often a lost factor uh, as we look at national security issues. But I think it's, it's principal in what you've been doing is trying to sort of investigate how identity is, is, is discussed, how it's perceived. Uh, and frankly, how the United States can impact. Yeah. It is, um, you know, I, I talk about the importance of diversity and not painting everything with one brush and saying all Muslims are doing this or all Muslims are doing that. So I, I, I really step away from saying, and this is the central thing that I find, but I will tell you, um, in the last two years that I've been traveling on the ground, um, I've been to 50 countries around the world and talking, as I just said, to Muslims under the age of 30, there's only one theme that comes up over and over again, and that is the navigation of identity. What does it mean to be Muslim on the planet in 2011? What is the difference between uh, modernity and Islam in some people's minds? How do you balance culture and religion? What is the difference between culture and religion? The navigation of this identity is central for us and we should care about it because we want these young people to be able to think about some of the themes that we've just discussed, the diversity of Muslims all, uh, all over the world, that it's not just one thing that is taking place, that there are different components to the way in which they think about themselves, the importance of democracy and Islam. Um, we don't want these young kids to only be isolated by narratives that come from places that we don't think are necessarily helpful to the way they think about the world. If a young person is only believing that there's only one way you can become Muslim, and that way is this way, 
then you're changing the whole face of the way a, a whole generation is growing up. So you want to be able to uh, broaden the conversation about identity. You want to be able to offer alternative narratives by credible, I mean, not government can't do this. Muslims themselves have to be able to reshape and recalibrate the conversation. Uh, and very importantly, it's important for the United States to understand that identity is an issue because as some of these questions uh, that we see on the front pages of the paper every day, um, you know, come into our minds, we as government people or, or whatnot can say, you know, every single day since September 12th, we have seen, uh, 2001, we have seen the word Islam or Muslims on the front page of a paper. At no other time in history has this ever happened. How does that shape a young kid? who's growing up at 12, 11, 13 years old, whatever it happens to be, how do they think about themselves and how do they think about how others think about them? Something very unique has happened to this generation. I don't care if you're a kid that is growing up in Jakarta or you're a kid growing up in Stockholm. The conversations I have when I talk about identity and I hear what they have to say, it is central to these kids because they're really, um, they're really challenged to find examples of people who are like them. They are not finding parallels with their parents' generation. They're looking to their own peers mm -hmm. to get answers, and I think that's very, very important for us to understand. Interesting. Um, I often say uh, and remind folks that uh, bin Laden, when he talked about 9-11, uh, he talked about it not just as, a, as an attack against the far enemy, but also as a moment of Muslim awakening sure. and, and an intent to draw people to the ideology of al-Qaeda. Um, in some ways, the Arab Spring uh, proves the antithesis of that awakening or, or is an alternate awakening. Um, how have you seen the Arab Spring uh, playing into uh, your work into this question of identity and how is it impacting well beyond the Arab world because so much of your focus is on Muslim communities outside of sort of classic Arab uh, countries the way we've traditionally thought about the so, issue. So you know I've been, um, I've been going around the world for the last couple of years obviously before what this has been a momentous year for the planet uh, in so many ways um, but I've been describing what I've been hearing from young people as a youth quake that the ideas that that are taking place uh, across the world by these young people under the age of 30 is historic because there's a ripple effect they're connected digitally um, with 140 characters on Twitter um, with uh, posting on Facebook, with an, uh, the access to, to be able to move those ideas forward. It doesn't matter how rich or poor you are. It doesn't matter if you're black or white or blue or pink. It doesn't matter what part of the world you're from. It doesn't matter how educated you are. Your ideas are moving fast and they're moving and they're connecting with each other. So this powerful effect of ideas, this youth quake that's happening, means that the generation under the age of 30 primarily is reshaping how they think about themselves but also how others think about them. So how does that play into some of the things that we've seen around the world? Now certainly, I don't think anybody could have predicted the ripple effect of what happened in Tunisia moving forward. I mean, I, I, there's scholars that are on TV 24-7 trying to say that they knew what was taking place. I mean, come on. It, it's been a remarkable, it's been a remarkable moment in our human history in terms of what's happening. But what is true is that what we're seeing is that these, these young, young folks are speaking up for what they want by being able to communicate with kids in other parts of the world who are their peers, they're seeing what they want and what they can do. Why can't it be theirs? So they're articulating this, they're moving, and they have the tools to be able to put powerfully uh, their images out there. And then they now have media that is actually following their tweets, following what they're saying, so they're, they're moving these ideas forward. What's important, I think, about the Arab Spring, um, I don't like that term, but I'll, I'll use it. Um, <laughs> What do you call it? I, 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 th I think it's very hard to define what it is. Um, you know, I, I think it... You go with youth quake? Listen, I, I think that there's a youth quake generally. <laughs> I'm not sure uh, about that, but I think that um, I think that's what, what's very powerful about what's, what's happening, um, what happened and what is happening in the Middle East. It is um, when it started and, and even in ways now, this hasn't been about religion. This is about... Um, this is about what they want for their future as, as citizens of their country mm -hmm. it, and, and uh, those freedoms that we all hold so dear in our, in our country. So whether AQ uh, or others are put, trying to put out a narrative that is trying to move a lot of these folks to believe, I think some of that has, has reshaped itself in the last few years, to be honest with you. But I think what, I th what I've seen by young people 
in terms of how they think about what's happening in the Middle East, the, the movement um, of the mind that, that the power that they have, that they count, that something really spectacular is having, happening here, and if that person in Tunisia, or that person in Tahrir Square, or that person on the road somewhere else is able to articulate and, and get attention, why can't I? Mm -hmm. And that, either virtually or, or physically. Farah, one of the things um, we've talked a lot about is where you've seen Muslim communities uh, coming under assault, yeah. ideologically, culturally. Can you give, give us a couple of examples of, of where you've seen that come in, into play? Either uh, communities under assault because of globalization or because of violent uh, extremism. Can you give us some, uh, some examples of what you've seen and maybe some things that concern you? So um, I told you that I've been to 50 countries around the world and there hasn't been a country that I've been to in which young people don't talk about their fear of external ideologies coming in and impacting their traditional culture and the way they view themselves as Muslims. Um, that's just a data point I'll put on the table for you. And whether, those, whether the impact of those voices come from foreign imams that come into their community or they come from the fact that parents are talking about their kids going going online and going to places they don't want them to go, or it is kids talking about free CDs on a street corner that are that are just available to anybody um, by very radical um, imams uh, that talk about a particular thing, or it's a new kind of music that's coming out that is impacting a young generation to believe X, Y, or Z. Um, this is a theme that is consistent. So certainly, there is a... Um, in my view, an increase of, uh, on, on, that, on that issue. There's some very specific examples um, that have, have, have been, um, that, that are still with me, that, that, that have surprised me. I mean, I had a, um, I don't know how many people know much about the Maldives, and you may think, the Maldives, why do I need to care about the Maldives? Well, um, you should care. I think it's a, it's a really important example. Um, this, is a, this is a nation that, uh, that has, is 100% Muslim. And it is a nation that I believe uh, over 800 years ago, Islam has been part of the culture. Um, and they have practiced their religion in the way they do in traditional societies. And when I went to, to the Maldives, um, they were unbelievably um, vocal about the threat of extremism and, and the changes that had taken place in the Maldives over the course of the last five, six years. Let me give you a very specific example. Um, traditionally in the Maldives, the women were able to go to school and be educated like men and had choices about how they dressed. Um, many of them did not cover their hair. Um, uh, and did not wear um, non-Maldivian um, dress. Um, so today, in 2011, uh, when you go to the Maldives, you see a very different shape uh, in terms of the societies. There has been pushback of some women getting educated, getting out of the house. Uh, they are dressed more um, in, a, in a fashion that you would see more in the Gulf than you would in a, a Maldivian society, which is obviously South Asia. So these are two different cultures. Why are, so that kind of thing should be a red flag to us as we think about how are cultures that are so embedded, 800 years of Islam, being impacted to change in ways, even in the last couple of years? That example in the Maldives, I could give you examples in other parts of the world too, in which people are really frightened by external voices that are saying, you aren't being Muslim enough. And let me tell you what that means for us. And so now they're reshaping. And, or they have young people who are being educated outside of their countries um, and are learning about a new different type brand, uh, way of living, and coming back and criticizing traditional culture and saying this isn't right and, and so therefore we're going to start moving you in a different direction. I'll finally say that I also think that, um, you know, not everything happens in the mosque. We, we know that I've just talked to you about the fact that there are things that are happening outside of the mosque, but the mosque also matters. Um, with the textbooks that are on the shelves of a mosque, the, uh, the way an imam chooses to teach young people to be uh, to value pluralism and to be respectful of differences and to uh, to interface with different kinds of communities is important too. Mm -hmm. So you will see um, a change in many countries in the world in which um, particular uh, changes have happened within the mosque so that it's become more conservative in the sense of they don't 
expand outside their own circles. Uh, this is very much true in Europe, um, and it is, it's uh, a little alarming, actually, if you think about the concept of, of, of what this means as Muslims who are living in democratic societies in Europe who are part of multi-cultural um, societies uh, that they are living as minorities. If you're isolating yourself and isolating yourself and isolating yourself, there are fourth generation um, Brits that I have met that have not met anyone outside of their own Muslim community. That's remarkable. Um, so these kinds of things are, are, are current in our world right now. I think they should be talked about. And, um, and I think what I'm seeing, it's not just governments that are, that are seeing these points, but in fact, uh, communities themselves that are com you know, commenting on it. Right. Um, and so you see Muslim groups that actually want to make, uh, make a difference in terms of broadening the conversation. Well, that's very important. Before, before I do that, let me put a little plug in for CSIS. There's a forthcoming report on the revival of Islam in Central Asia, uh, which really the important. Transnational Threat Project is uh, about <clears throat> to publish, uh, which talks not only about the, the issue on the ground, but how governments are reacting or overreacting, uh, which will be an important report. Uh, but, but your last point is a very interesting one, Farah, because the question of how um, communities are actually organizing both to defend their sense of identity and culture uh, but also to, to interact and even to interact with you and the U.S. government. Can you speak a little bit to some examples of, of what that organization looks like and then how you as a U.S. government official interact? Because I, I do want to talk about some of the complications and difficulties that you have as a U.S. official in all of this. So, I mean, you and I have um, worked together since 2004. Um, and I remember conversations that we would have about, well, where, where are we going to actually build partnerships with uh, people on the ground who have credible, um, credible voices, for lack of a better term, that can actually impact the way a community thinks about things. And I think that there have been a lot of really great lessons our country and other, uh, and other countries around the world have learned about groups on the table. I said earlier today that you can't just go to the biggest group out there and say, hey, you're the leader of it, and therefore you need to be the spokesperson. We're doing a lot more and uh, to, to go deep and go wide and get to know. I mean, that's, what our, that's how our embassies are actually thinking about the different constituencies and how we have to be very e even-handed about how we, how we approach this. Um, but what I am seeing is, I think, in the last couple of years, even more compelling movement by Muslims themselves, uh, online and offline, who have said, listen, we're tired of waiting for others to stand up and talk about this. We're going to do something ourselves. And so wh whether or not they're doing educational campaigns or they're doing mosque management and transparency campaigns or they're going online and creating alternative um, voices on identity and on religion and theology, uh, whether or, or not they're starting campaigns uh, on Facebook to have people become more, um, more aware of uh, issues around uh, 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 the role of women in Islam, for example. There are more and more NGOs that are started, uh, that have started individuals, and importantly, what we're trying to do is to connect a lot of these movements and voices around the world. I think the greatest strength the United States has is to be the convener and the facilitator and the intellectual partner with the ideas that we hear on the ground. And that is something that is, you know, I'm often asked, you know, how much money do you have and how much is the United States government? I could have $800 trillion and I wouldn't have enough money to be able to do the kinds of things that need to be done. Civil society matters. And how we engage and partner as government with civil society and, and move their ideas forward. And it isn't, by the way, just government. Importantly, and I want to stress this fact, private sector has a role to play too. This is something that all of us have to do together. And so I think giving seed money to cool ideas by young, innovative minds on the ground, whether it's a $30,000 grant or a $50,000 grant, those ideas can move forward. We have to leverage this moment. We have to leverage how young people are thinking about their generation, because their ideas matter for this generation. It isn't a whole bunch of people in an ivory tower that's able to tell a 22-year-old how they ought to think about things. I'm sorry. Nor is it, by the way, governments that suggest, well, you ought to do it this way. Talk to somebody within the communities. 
on what's going to work here. I know a guy in uh, on the ground in Oslo, super amazing guy, who looked around and saw a lot of Somali immigrants who were getting impacted by narratives that were coming out from outside of Norway. And they were being moved in a direction that they shouldn't go. And he said, I can do something about this. I've been working with the disenfranchised youth for a long time and at-risk youth. We're going to use hip hop. We're going to use video. We're going to use film. And we're going to get we're going to get these kids off the street thinking about things in new ways. Elvis is an amazing example of a guy who has used lessons that we know, lessons that we understand for communities and grassroots and coalition building and innovative tools and moving it forward. And he's working very specifically with Somali youth in, in, in Oslo, and he's doing a tremendous job. Um, but it is that kind of example. What would happen if a business said, I believe in that kind of guy? Um, I'm going to give him X amount of money to do something. Or a government says, just the way we do with VC funders for, for, for business, hey, mm -hmm. let me hear your ideas. Let's, let, let's, let's put some investment in that. Right. Farah, how do you deal with the, the limitations of being a US government official? I'm now on the outside, so <laughs> I, I feel somewhat liberated. But um, you, know, you have to deal with the realities that um, when you walk in a room, People are going to be skeptical because, in, in a way, you represent not only the government but foreign policies uh, that remain fairly consistent. The things that, like support for Israel, that are very controversial uh, in uh, many Muslim communities. Um, you also have constraints in terms of picking ideological sides, and so you can't go into a country and say, "We like this brand of Islam, this brand of yeah. moderation." versus this one. It's a challenge we've, we've had, obviously, uh, not just internationally, but domestically. How do you deal with, with those types of constraints and issues, as well as, frankly, the sensitivities that go along with some of this? Because you might want to go into a country like Pakistan and say, yet again, we need madrasa reform. And that creates all sorts of sensitivity. So how do you how do you juggle that? It's a it's a really fair question, and it's, a, it's one of the hardest components, obviously, of my job. I mean, I, I think if I were only um, if I were only talking about the comfortable, nice stuff, I wouldn't be doing my job. And I think providing a platform for people to be able to talk and ask really hard questions, they may not always get the answers that they want, but I think you have to be fair and be able to, to have that interchange with them. That's first, so you make yourself accessible. Secondly, um, I think uh, also, I mean, I, I think that there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of opportunity to, uh, to, not to educate, that's not the right word, but to articulate in different ways, different perspectives, both from, from the folks on the ground talking to us and us talking with them. And I think the more you provide opportunities to have those kinds of conversations, you can flush things out. I'm not going into countries trying to, quote, win hearts and minds, unquote. I hate that term. I hope we eradicate it from uh, our vocabulary. <laughs> I think it's very insulting that you would, anyone would suggest that any government in the world is trying to go in and try to get you to like us. Um, if you like us, great, and I want people to respect and understand our country. But the, the conversation of building trust and how you build relationships means it takes time over time. It's not a data point on whether or not this poll or that poll says you're doing something. We, I do talk about foreign policy. I talk about it in every conversation I have. I can tell you the top three things that are asked all the time. And Sure, somebody's going to ask that now that I said that. Um, but, um, but what I have seen very fairly is that while somebody may be absolutely furious about our country on this position or that position, and they made it really clear, they also want to work at the same time on something that they find in terms of a common interest. Mm -hmm. So they, so we are able to do two things at the same time. And, and obviously, there are colleagues uh, at the Department of State who are working on some of these hard issues because that's their job. Um, and I have a very specific mandate. So, um, so we are, um, it, it's it, it is a challenge. It's, um, it's something that I, I deal with every single day. It is also a challenge, to be absolutely fair with you, um, when, when you, when you are uh, in a situation where somebody will not um, believe the intent of this president in terms of how he is trying to engage, that mm. there's, they, they think that there's some other thing that is going on. It's pretty obvious that our country needs to build relationships with one-fourth of the planet for now and for the long term. And over the course of the next 20 years, our nation needs to do as much as we can to make sure that this generation is working with us 
They may not always agree with us, mm -hmm. but that this generation, we are finding the places of common interest. We're finding and using more tools in our toolbox. And we're taking the time, frankly, to hear new innovative ideas because actually we can't think of everything ourselves. And this is a long-term investment that we are making uh, in, this, in this. It's not a question of right here, right now, because we are afraid of X, Y, or Z. It's because we understand numbers across the world and the importance uh, of, of our nation being able to have those bridges built with civil society. I'm gobbled up enough time. I'm going to take uh, prerogative with two more questions, if that's OK. Uh, I could sit here for a long time, as you could probably tell uh, with Farah. Farah, uh, you've spent a lot of time, and the Secretary spent a lot of time, on empowering women and the issue of women's rights and issues uh, in diplomacy. Speak a little bit to um, the issue of women's rights in the context of the kind of engagement you're, you're involved in. And then it's a little bit of a platform for you to talk about the, <laughs> the initiative I mentioned at the sure. start. Um, talk, talk to those issues. So obviously, I'm talking very specifically about the things that I've heard from both men and women in Muslim communities um, <laughs> around the world. I think I want to, before I talk about what I've heard from the Muslim voices, let me talk to you about the problems I'm hearing from the non-Muslim voices. Mm. Um, there is a lot of conversation um, in the media um, in our country and around the world that would like to stereotype what it means to be a Muslim woman. That is a really hard position uh, to step away from because when you begin, again, to paint everybody the same way, assume all these things that you don't really know, um, not take the time to understand what's taking place within a particular, what's the difference between the culture and what is embedded in the religion when you don't have take the time to understand the wide spectrum of experiences of Muslim women around the world. You play into this idea that everybody's all the same, and, and it, it is very difficult to step away from that. So the first thing I'd say is for those for, for those people who actually allow that to happen, you're, make, you're hindering a really important process, which is gender equality uh, around the world, and that, that Muslims, um, uh, both men and women, are trying to actually articulate these things in new ways. The second thing I'd say is I think that there is a lot of confusion um, that I've heard on the ground uh, in, the, in the conversations that I've ha I had with um, Muslims who have asked if there is more information, more, um, uh, more, more opportunities for them to learn about what's taking place with Muslims around the world. Now, we are the United States government. We cannot and we do not talk about theology. I am not going to you know, bring forward what, what rights people have within, but I can talk about the fact that there are many NGOs and many initiatives around the world that, that in which people are talking about the role of women in Islam, that talk about these, the diversity, and I think that is a very important thing that needs to be uh, highlighted. Um, we don't often hear that conversation here in the United States. In some parts of the world we do. There's a, an amazing <coughs> NGO in, in Kuala Lumpur called Sisters in Islam who've done some amazing work. There are some incredible uh, academics. There are very important, uh, actually, bloggers and others who are online talking about these issues. Uh, you see a very different shape, actually, that's happened in our country mm. uh, for American Muslim women that have actually articulated the experience of the diversity of experiences here in our country as well. Um, so. This is, uh, th this is sort of the environment in which I, I am navigating. When I talk about the rights of women, um, it isn't about the rights of women in Islam. It is the rights of women, period. We as the United States believe in gender equality. And the Secretary of State has in embedded in absolutely all of what she's doing the, the forceful um, articulation of the need for girls and women to be up and front and center in, in the conversations that we're having as well. So the many initiatives that have been brought out in the last two and a half years through the Office of the Women's Empowerment at the State Department, and if you're interested in that issue, there's a, a great deal of information on the State Department website. Um, from my perspective, one of the things that has been very problematic, um, and you know this, this is not a gender thing necessarily, but it plays into it, is the false, uh, the false narrative that democracy and Islam are not compatible. Mm -hmm. And you have got to see more people pushing back against that. We have, we articulated it very clearly in our country. But I, I think one of the incredible things about um, the movement that we are seeing uh, with 
voices in, in the Middle East and in other places that the, is that women should have a role in their countries and that they have the right to take part in what happens in the future of the countries. This marries very nicely with what the Secretary is launching next week, which is the Women in Public Service Initiative. And on December 15th, uh, you can watch the proceedings live uh, by, a, by the web. Um, where she will be talking about why it is so important that women around the world uh, are entering into public service and giving, given opportunities not only to enter but to uh, move up and move in to different var varieties of whether you're a civil service ser servant or you're a foreign service uh, officer, whether you're uh, an appointee, whether you are somebody who's a, uh, who are uh, on a commission. Public service is a lot of different things. Um, but we want to see more and more women come to the table in our country and around the world. So the platform of people that are coming forward next week are tremendous. I mean, we have Secretary Solis, we have Secretary Sebelius, who will be speaking about these things. Obviously, the Secretary of State, Secretary Albright will be coming. Um, you're going to hear from people like Gloria Steinem. You're going to be hearing from people like the President of Kosovo, um, Prime Ministers, and, and various other members. It is an all-star lineup next week to talk about this issue, because it's not obviously just about our country, but it's about what we need to see around the world, and whether you're the Nora Berra, the Minister of Health in France, who comes from an immigrant background and is on uh, and is doing something really remarkable in her country, or you are, um, or you are an emerging young leader from Ghana or Zimbabwe, and you see yourself as being part of the future of policymaking and politics in the in the world. We have got to put this on the table. This is the next frontier. We talk about women around a boardroom table. We've got to talk about women around the policy table. I applaud you for this because I know this is uh, a, an initiative you've been pushing for a long time. Uh, I applaud the Seven Sisters Colleges. You're a graduate of Smith College. Thanks for the plug. Um, <laughs> Sir, Secretary Clinton, Secretary Albright, well my said. wife, or Wellesley oh, grads. Oh, Juan, you had to do that. <laughs> I, I, knew, I knew you were going to do that. That's fine. That's um, fair. And I forgot to mention, far as well as a graduate of the Fletcher the School of Law and Diplomacy <laughs> at Tufts, uh, two times at USAID. And so... Uh, and is currently, by the way, speaking of women in public service, the highest ranking Muslim American woman uh, in the U.S. government, uh, born in Kashmir. Um, one final question. Uh, I know you've done uh, some very interesting and uh, sort of first of its kind research uh, on the continuity of U.S. engagement with Muslims and Muslim communities. Can you, can you give all of us uh, just a really brief sketch of kind of what you found with respect to how presidents and administrations have engaged on the issue of Islam and with Muslims? Thanks, Juan. Um, one of the things that was very frustrating for me um, in the entire time that I've been in government from 2003 onward is that people were always scrambling to find out of a moment when a president said something nice about Muslims or, um, you know, data points about American history and Islam. And I mean, I have to tell you, I mean, I obviously studied U.S. history and, and so did all of you. It's not something that is in our, in our classes. We don't learn about that aspect. Um, so I was learning uh, along the way, and certainly when I was at the White House and, uh, uh, and, and, and in other roles, really kept thinking, you know, there's got to be more out there. Well, there wasn't more out there. One of the first things I did uh, as special representative was I said, I need a timeline. I need a timeline of American presidents and diplomacy and Islam because I'm tired of people scrambling at the last minute, doing insane Google searches, <laughs> trying to figure out what makes sense, and you know, calling schools and historians to double check that the Google fact is. I mean, you know, it, it's it's not right. So um, we partnered with an amazing woman. Her name is Precious Muhammad. Um, she went to Harvard. All right, I'm good, calling out of school. Um, but Precious you know, had been doing some really great work and a few other um, folks. And, and I said to her, can we actually create a timeline that we can go back and I want to hear it. I want to hear it from the Founding Fathers all the way up to President Obama. What has happened? What president said what? What is our, how have we talked about what we know that's in the Constitution, which is that um, it doesn't matter what religion you are, you have the same rights in America. How was it articulated? And where was it articulated? Well, we spent almost two years pulling together, um, inc just she's done a inc wonderful work um, that will be live and on her website, which uh, will come up very soon, and, I, and I'll share it with you so you can send it out to, to your 
to your folks. Um, but um, we have seen, obviously, from President Washington, frankly, all the way to President Obama, um, there have been, I mean, more than 20 presidents have particularly talked about the fact that American Muslims are part of America, that they're given the same rights as everybody else. These are things we all know. Obviously, we've all read the Constitution. But for a president of the United States to be able to talk about it in a very particular way makes a difference. There have been some really wonderful things that John Adams said, that, that Thomas Jefferson said, very specifically about Muslims and why they said it at that moment in time and what they were viewing for our country going forward. They would call them Mohammedans. They did. Some yeah. of them did. Some of them didn't. Um, yeah. uh, but it also very, I mean, I learned this fact too, um, things that President Ford did. President, things that President Clinton did, President Bush, uh, President Eisenhower. I mean, it, it is really an incredible journey for us to take at a moment in America when there are shrill voices that can be heard in, in every corridor. Um, I think we ought to know our facts about our country. And, and so that's one of the reasons that we, we did this, because I, I personally think it's important to say this happened in such and such year, and this president said this then, and this is why. That's fantastic. All right, well, let's open it up now. This was a fantastic tour de force already. <laughs> Ron, why don't we ask, I'll ask you to identify yourself, turn on your mic, uh, we're recording this uh, for folks, uh, and then ask a question. Thank you. Hi, yeah, Ron Marks. I'm actually on the steering committee here for the Transnational Threats Group. Boy, you're enthusiastic. Thank you very much for that enthusiasm. As a taxpayer, I feel better. <laughs> um, no, I really do. I, you know, it's, it's a tough narrative to deal with, um, but I'd be loath not to ask the question. Uh, both allies of Pakistan and Saudi Arabia in particular have not been helpful to this process. As you know, they've either ignored their internal conservatives who've supported madrasas and educational institutions throughout Europe, throughout Asia, et cetera. I was wondering how you're engaging with that because I must admit my initial reaction to this is it's smart to work with the under 30s, but all the blogs in the world aren't going to help you if you have governments in both places either turning a blind eye or supplying money to very conservative groups who really aren't interested in developing either democracy or freedom for women. You know, those aren't the only two countries, let me just be really clear, um, that we have it's, it's uh, state actors and non-state actors that are impacting um, the narratives and the conversations that are out there. It is a remarkable thing to think about 1.6 billion people on the planet who are Muslim and influences that are affecting them. Um, it, you, you cannot boil the ocean. I, I, am, I am very aware of that. And I, by no stretch of the imagination, um, suggest that one blog is going to change the way. I mean, it's, it's, it, we have to go really deep um, in, in, in a lot of these issues. But to your point, um, our country has been very clear and very forceful about the importance of textbooks, the importance of what's being taught vis-a-vis uh, -vis pluralism and respect and um, uh, human rights. And I mean, we're doing that in many, many different ways. And, and I don't want to push you off your, you, you, but if you combine the, the, the forces within the State Department that are actually talking about these issues, whether it's from a CT perspective or it, a human rights perspective, two sides of the, 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 the table, or an education perspective, consistently the voices from the US government have been very clear and very rich in terms of what needs to be done and how they need to be done. You have to keep pounding on it. You have to be, and as you can see, I'm not afraid to talk about it. I think you have to be able to say what it is. Um, and, and I, this is why I'm saying to you, I mean, I think governments can do only so much. There are more people who are against crazy voices than there are people who believe in them. And you have to be able to, to, to um, amplify those alternative voices. You have to be able to do more. What, I can't get over the fact that we've been 10 years since 9-11. There should have been much more mo progress within civil society. And, and I can't blame civil society, but I do blame all of us as citizens of the planet. What can we do to help those voices that want to, to, to amplify themselves? Which is why I go back to small seed grants from private sector and non, you know, these, you, there are so many more uh, points of, of, of movement than there ever have been on this issue. Let's engage now. Let's do far more now. Yes, ma'am. 
Hi, I'm Elizabeth Duda. I'm a student. Um, I have two questions. One, I'm just kind of curious, a pop culture question. Have you seen All American Muslim, and what do you think that how that impacts um, people? I'm a big fan of TLC. I'm not gonna lie. And um, <laughs> do you have? And I you spoke about uh, the change in Muslim societies in Europe, and I was wondering if you work with any. European groups, government, organizations, uh, what partners do you work with? Sure. Um, so on your first point, I have to tell you that I had my reality TV debut last Sunday on All American Muslim. Um, for exactly two seconds, it was fabulous. If you blink, I'm are, gone. Are, are you giving autographs today? No, no. It was. It was. I was happy. It was very nice of them to 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 um, come into my office. But um, I, I, th I think that there is obviously there's been a lot of conversation about this this show, and and I uh, and I think, you know, it's a television show. I think it's important to talk about. Um, talk about it in the context of it, it is a television show. Let us remember that. However, images matter. Um, humanizing people ma matters. Just the same way we talked about the Cosby show, we talked about anything else. Things that are moving minds um, can, can matter. And I think so for some, that show has been an opportunity to get an insight into communities they never would have seen before. For others, they've had problems with the show because they think that there's, you know, they're not as diverse as they could be. I don't have a position on the show. I think it's a television show, and, and I'm, um, you know, so. In terms of Europe, um, okay, so again, I'm not gonna talk about Europe like it's all the same thing. Um, in my job before this one, that job was created for me um, when I was at the White House because when we had to deal with the Danish cartoon crisis, um, we realized, as I think as a government, that we, there was far more that we needed to do uh, in terms of engaging Muslim communities on the ground. And Ambassador Dan Fried, who was, uh, who was the Assistant Secretary for Europe at the time, asked me to move from the White House over to the State Department to focus all day, every day, on building strategies for our embassies throughout Western Europe on engaging with Muslims. And through that experience, for, for that period of time, I mean, uh, I think it was something like going to 19 countries and 55 cities across Western Europe. So I will say to you that, um, of course, I know a lot about um, these wonderful uh, partners that we can have on the ground. Some NGOs are really small, some are more robust, but there's some terrific movements that are taking place by young Muslims um, across Western Europe uh, that are doing doing great things to change the narrative, to increase the pace of, um, of awareness about what it means to be a European Muslim, or very specifically, a Dutch Muslim, or a Spanish Muslim, or whatever that might be. There's also a lot more that's been done in terms of connecting some of those European voices around the world. There, I mean, around the, uh, yeah, both around the world, actually, and, and within Europe. But there's a um, network called the CEDAR Network, C-E-D-A-R, um, which stands for connecting European, no, connecting emerging Muslim, I mean, it's great. It's the cedarnetwork.com. I'm not got, I'm totally losing my mind. I haven't had enough coffee this morning. Um, but the Cedar Network is one place where they have some of these amazing Muslim professionals around the world. There are also um, a lot of things that our embassies are doing, and I want to focus a moment on that because I didn't talk to Juan about it. This isn't a job that I'm doing that is Farah running around the world trying to do whatever it is I'm saying I'm doing, right? This is about how our embassies, there are, there are forces on the ground who do engagement. I work with our embassies hand in glove. Our ambassadors are the ones that are using their teams to go deep and go wide. So I'm working in collaboration so all of our Europeans and embassies and our embassies in other parts of the world are doing as much as we can to get to know who are these new people, who are the new voices, what are new ways we can engage. They're moving their, again, moving their ideas from um, a non-capital city to, to, to others to say, wow, you know, you ought to hear what's happening in Leipzig as opposed to what's necessarily happening in Berlin. You want to get to know the, the breadth of what's taking place. I've had a lot of, um, I feel very fortunate that I have had the European experience that I have because it really opened my eyes to what is possible. And I will say that even since 2007, so much has taken place in Europe in terms of civil society doing a lot more than they've done before. You're welcome. Hey, one, of, one of the great groups that I know you're a fan of, I am as well, the Sisters Against Violent Extremism yep. in Vienna, which uh, a collection of women actors around the world, but based in Europe. David? 
Thanks, Juan. David Trulio, Raytheon Company, also Senior Fellow at the Homeland Security Policy Institute. I, I applaud you for citing the, the, the importance of the role that the private sector has to play. I was hoping we could drill down a little bit into that. You mentioned grants. Uh, great. Uh, if we break out companies versus foundations, and I'm curious, what's worked, but maybe what hasn't worked uh, despite good intentions? So people get really scared about um, about giving money to to um, ideas in this area. I, I can't figure it out, I guess. I, I come from the private sector, so I suppose if somebody came to me in my pre-public sector life and said, we want to have you start something um, on emerging Muslim voices, I'd be like, whoa, we don't do religion. What is the deal with that? But let's take the religion part out of this, because it's not about the religion. It's about how we are thinking about a youth generation, um, and again, the connectivity with what we want to do uh, as a country. I mean, from the private sector, I could sit here and talk to you about all the reasons why a, government, a, a private company would want to have stability in a country and want to see it robust, and you know that as well as I do. But there's something very human about what I'm talking about, and that is um, if we see something that's happening on the ground, we as Americans, we, we usually call it out, and we usually see what we can do, whether it is poverty, whether it is a lack of education, whether it is something else. We are seeing something happening right here in real time around the world. And what are we doing? We're talking about it. It isn't right for a 15-year-old kid who has grown up all day, every day since September 12, 2001, to think that the world hates them, to grow up not having the opportunity to impact the world the way they can, to live up to their potential. There's something that we can do. And so when I think about a private sector company, I think about, well, talk about it in terms of youth programs. I don't care if you're only dealing with Muslims. Talk, it about, talk about it in terms of youth. Talk about how you give these kids a chance, how you connect amazing voices around the world. This youth quake is not about Islam. This youth quake is about this peer group talking to each other about what matters for their future. So when I think about um, a company, I think the, the skittishness for a lot of companies in terms of investing has been about religion. I think you need to turn that a little bit. But I also th think very, on a very serious front now um, on the violent extremism piece, okay? You and I both know that there are voices out there that impact young minds, and they do it in very different ways. We have to, non-government has to help here because with government, it is tainted. With government, it is, it's, it, it has that burden. Why can't we be more creative about how we get the private sector to say, hey, let's start this fund. Let's start a fund that we do the same thing that we do with everything else, every other issue that's out there, and give small seed grants. Well, how do you know that that money's gonna make a difference? The only way I can tell you that we can make a difference is to try. Not everything you plant is gonna bloom, but some of it will. And what happens if it's that awesome idea that actually revolutionizes how young kids think about themselves and push back against violent extremism? That $50,000 grant that you gave is gonna pay off in a huge way. I'm an optimist. I believe that we can make this difference. And if I were in the private sector, I would tell you I would be moving, I would be moving in that direction because I've seen it. I've been in this space now since 2003. I've seen it all day, every day, that the smallest amounts of money from non-government can make a difference to how something is, is, is shaped. This gentleman here. I say that all the time. Yes. And now we are like have challenge and fear about today. But fifteen years later, like in twenty thirty, it's projected that two point two percent uh, billion of its youth population in the world. So how can we tackle that problem? Like we have to have some kind of um, policy like to address this because otherwise some of them negatively get addressed because this project the question is on on just tighten it for me yes that like when, well, for example from christian missionary all aspects when they they can go to any country like without any limitation but when muslim then not many muslim NGOs in even in america because they are like uh, because i think it's the way it has to be managed 
my question is how can we go forward to the future? How can we uh, change? Sorry, for this word salary. So, in terms of American aid? Yes. <coughs> in other parts of the world? Yes. Well, I think, you know, um, you know about the United States Agency for International Development, which is our arm of the United States government that does economic and humanitarian aid. Um, and so many of the um, programs and initiatives that we have on the ground through USAID are actually in places where Muslims live. Um, and so you are seeing a lot of schools being built, um, hospitals, um, educational programs. Uh, you're seeing a lot uh, being done on transparency, rule of law, these kinds of things. Um, I am not somebody who, ha who is currently working at USAID, though I used to. I have a lot of respect for the agency. But if you're interested in, in a particular part of the world and what we are doing in that, in that part of the world on pick your issue, women, girls, education, poverty, whatever it is, environment, you can see where, where, what, where, we're, do where we're doing what and why we're doing what. Yes. Sorry. Hey. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. It's okay. Um, Petty Amiramati from Word. I, I think what he may be also bringing up is an interesting point um, that, um, that Muslims don't have um, big aid organizations to help with the delivery. So he, like he was referring to the Christian missionary organizations or other Christian aid organizations, that Muslims don't seem to have the capacity. There's Islamic Relief that seems to be the only one. Like, do you have any recommendations for how they can get more involved in the charitable sector, the aid sector? Um, well, I'm, I think that's a, that. that's a fair point. I am going to push back a little bit. Um, first of all, the Aga Khan, as you very well know, is doing tremendous work, and I think I would say they're one of the leaders in the world um, doing this kind of stuff, and that's an enormous um, arm. Um, so my question is to you. Um, so if we're, working, if we're working on helping people on the ground, and there are really fabulous organizations that are doing this, do you have to have a Muslim organization that's delivering the aid, or can you use, that's just one thing I just put out there. If in fact one feels that there needs to be more opportunities to get aid out from a Muslim organization, um, my goodness, there, there are so many innovators in America, so many entrepreneurs that have tried to start and, and, and jumpstart, actually, the process. Um, I think that it's going gonna, it's gonna to be interesting. I mean, I, I'm interested to hear uh, your response to, to, to me. But I, I, am, I am absolutely certain that if any individual out there feels that they can build a new mountain, they can go out there and do that in this country. I think that's going to have to be it, unfortunately. Build a new mountain, idea. <laughs> Are we okay on time? All right, let's let's go with one more. You you made your plea well, so last one. Thank you, Farah. I'm Jinning Nguyen from Voice of Vietnamese Americans. Um, would you educate me about the challenges that we have with the Muslim community in Pakistan? Gave me a hard, big, gigantic question at the end. So the challenges that we have. Um, so let me just give it from very much from, from my experience in Pakistan when I was visiting a special representative. Um, I think that th this is a country that we, it's very, it's very complex. I can't answer that question like, like this. It's a very complex question. Um, from my perspective on young people, with young people, one of the, cha one of the challenges that I have had is um, the combination of being able to focus on some of these um, these innovative ideas and projects at the same time when there's some very serious issues happening on the ground day to day. So it's that balance that's taking place. I did meet some amazing entrepreneurs when I was in Pakistan who were really interested in, obviously, the future of their country and trying to work on things um, you know, in, in new ways. But it is going to take time. I mean, I think that, that we, have to, um, we, have to, we have to get to know this generation in new ways. And I think the... Frankly speaking, it is the context of the environment and things that are going on on the ground, both politically and policy-wise, and 
at the same time that you're trying to engage uh, a group of, uh, of, of young, uh, vibrant uh, folks on the ground. Now, I've brought in, I, I mean, there's, there, there are many young Pakistanis that I've met um, who are part and parcel of the, the networks that we're building. Generation Change is a, is a network that, we, with, that the Secretary of State launched in 2010, um, where we're trying to get change makers around the world to um, get to know each other. Uh, and there are several folks uh, that, that that fit into that and are part of Generation Change uh, with 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 a Pakistani background, so it has been it's been great. Daniel Norani is one of them, and he's terrific. And if you don't know him, I'll tell you afterwards how to get how to learn about his work. Well, Farah, let me uh, let me just sort of add a coda here uh, and feeding off of Ron's comment about um, being reassured that not only our taxpayer dollars are being used well, but um, frankly the the satisfaction that those of us who know you and have watched your career uh, have in understanding how not only energetic you are, but how innovative you, you've been and what a, what a driver you've been for big ideas. Um, and I think for um, America and Americans at a time when there are questions about the role of Muslim Americans and shrill voices, uh, I think we all need to be very proud of, uh, of you, the work you've done, and frankly, the fact that you're one of our great patriots. Um, and others like you in the U.S. government, Muslim Americans who've devoted their lives uh, to doing all the right things and all the good things for uh, American security. So I want to thank you on, on, that, on that score and thank you for your time. I know how uh, precious it is. And I want to thank you all for taking time to be with us. So join me in thanking Farah. And with that, we hope to see you again at the next CSIS event. Thank you. <laughs>